Okay, we're ready to get started. I'm Sabrina Gonzalez and I have Dr. Jim Webb with me. He is the program director for Manufacturing Systems Management. He's gonna to talk to you guys about your program. There are a couple of things that I wanted to point out for you. On the left-hand side corner of your screen, you will see a Q&A um, option. Feel free to type in questions as we go. We will wait until the end of the presentation to answer those questions. Um, and we look forward to hearing from your questions and now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Webb. Thank you very much Sabrina. Well thank you very much for uh, for dialing in. I understand some of you may be uh, <coughs> excuse me calling in and listening to this on your on the phone so you won't have the uh, benefit of being able to see the the video part but uh, we'll try and describe that as best we can. Okay, one of the first questions that I get from a lot of students is why should I get a degree that has anything to do with manufacturing? And, you know, a, a lot of rumors go around about, gosh, you know, manufacturing is dying in this country. It's all moving offshore and uh, nothing could be further from the truth. That is not only trend before. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of rhetoric of surrounding the current administration. They're trying to bring jobs, manufacturing jobs back into the United States. But at the same time, there's a lot of trends that are long term trends that show the strength of the manufacturing economy here in the United States, and more importantly for you, jobs that are here in the United States and around the world in manufacturing. As you can see uh, from the screen that we have up, you know, manufacturers contributed about to, to a little more than $2 trillion to the, uh, the economy, which is good because any for every $1 spent in manufacturing, you know, it's another $1.81 that's added to the economy for, through uh, what we call the multiplier effect. We currently have a uh, little more than 12 million manufacturing workers in the United States, which is about 9% of all workers in the United States. So the manufacturing accounts for a very large sector of uh, people working here. Average manufacturing worker, just the worker, makes it a little more than $80,000 a year, and that includes pay and benefits. So we also have the largest percentage of workers who actually have health benefits paid, provided by their employer. So, you know, manufacturers over the last couple of decades uh, manufacturers have had a lot of growth. At the same time, they've gotten a lot more lean to help them uh, compete a, a lot globally, a lot more effectively. So uh, man, U.S. manufacturing is really uh, being heard around the world. So at, at the same time, over the next decade, now all this is coming from the National Association of Manufacturers who compiles this data, and they're projecting that over the next decade, there's going to be another three and a half million manufacturing jobs. Uh, and two million of those may go unfilled just because there's no skills available to bring them in, which is why you need to continually update your skills uh, in, in the manufacturing area and in the engineering disciplines, okay? <clears throat> so, so for the, uh, over the last 25 years, you know, manufacturing goods have uh, quadrupled, world trade, um, it has doubled between uh, 2000 and 2014, which is the latest I could get data for. So that, that goes from a four point eight, uh, almost five trillion to a little more than 12 trillion. So taken alone, manufacturing in the United States would be the ninth largest economy in the world. A foreign direct investment, that means money coming from outside the United States into manufacturing inside the United States. It exceeded uh, you know a trillion dollars for the first time ever. Uh, U.S. affiliates of a foreign multinational enterprises now employ 2 million manufacturing workers in the United States. We're seeing a lot of that here actually in the Dallas-Fort Worth area as companies like uh, Toyota start to uh, bring their manufacturing capabilities and their entire manufacturing headquarters here to the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth area. So manufacturers perform more than three quarters of all private sector research R&D and are driving more and more innovation than any other sector. This is an exciting area to be in. And this is why we encourage uh, all of our uh, students to take a strong look at uh, getting a manufacturing oriented degree. So a lot of the reason that, that uh, this boom occurs is um, quite frankly, in the United States, we have trade policies and we, that allow us to be able to manufacture competitively and the availability of capital inside the United States. We've got a very unique economic system here that allows us to be able to have uh, that entrepreneurial spirit where you can come in, you can uh, drive a manufacturing company virtually from scratch into something that's very, very sustainable and turn it eventually into a large company. And that's uh, the American enterprise system. So that's another reason to, you know, you can come in, you can work for a large company, you can work for a smaller company 
and, uh, and drive it to a larger company. And where we find most of the manufacturing jobs are coming, uh, especially in the United States, is uh, from smaller companies becoming much larger companies, as opposed to somewhere like, say, Germany, where you know most of them come from a family operations, where they, ba they band together families and, and drive that way. So in the, in the real manufacturing sector, as you can see here from this slide, you know, the GDP is growing and it's doing rather well, but at the same time, manu real manufacturing is exceeding that uh, beyond the depression of course, or the uh, recession that we had in the 2008. Uh, we see this, uh, especially here in the North Texas area. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are moving their entire headquarters here. And as a result, a lot of associated jobs. Uh, Jacobs Engineering just announced that they're moving their uh, complete headquarters to downtown Dallas. Toyota, as I mentioned before, Pegasus Foods, Kubota Tractors, all these people are moving here. And, uh, we're, and of course, SMU is working with them to be able to, to get their engineers uh, educated and get them experience and uh, hopefully some of our engineers hired into those companies. Uh, also, one of the things driving this in the North Texas area is a chief executive magazine just came out and said, hey, Texas is the best state for business, the number one state for business. A lot of that is because of the economic policies and a lot of the things that we put in place in order to drive businesses here. So all that is a long-winded way to say, why should you get a degree in manufacturing? It's a great opportunity and it's a great time to get one because of the, the impetus and all the momentum that the manufacturing field has, especially here in the United States and, and globally and especially here in the, in the Texas area. Now, to get into the, uh, the program, you're going to need a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering related field or a closely related scientific field with a minimum GPA of 3.0. Now, <clears throat> we are having pretty good experience admitting students who have very, very strong academic performance in some sort of a business discipline, <clears throat> either a business management or a supply chain or something like that, as long as they have manufacturing experience, uh, particularly with some of the larger firms. We have a lot of uh, uh, people from companies here locally, you know, Lockheed, Bell, Texas Instruments, whatever, uh, who have uh, a lot of manufacturing experience and that experience has been able to provide them a nice foundation to be able to move into this program and, and are able to succeed. So we take a strong look at them as well. <clears throat> the hybrid executive format is something that's very, very unique to the program and it's really designed for somebody who's got a really busy professional life and uh, is continually working on their career. So you don't have to take time off from your career in order to go out and get a master of science degree. We typically have, uh, you know, five sessions per semester and they're split into a, a, a Monday night lecture. That's uh, four hours of record of uh, that's recorded. And that's usually on Monday evenings and then four hours of live interaction in a classroom that's typically on Saturdays start at 10 and go until about 2.30 lunch is provided there. Uh, the Monday evening lectures, we tape those because, you know, people work, we understand that, you're working professionals. And as a result, uh, they usually download the lecture and watch it sometime during the week so they're prepared to come into class on Saturday and the concepts that we talk about on Monday evenings, they can apply in the class on Saturdays. Uh, of course, for distance students, if you can't make it into the classroom, uh, you can go ahead and, you know, we have uh, different types of tools and techniques that we use via the internet where you can actually collaborate and work on and work with the Saturday class and still have that interactive experience uh, using those kinds of communications tools. Our teaching staff, we feel, is a pretty pretty unique. Um, I'm at the top of the list there. You know, I guess I'm relatively uh, the same as most of the other instructors. In my particular case, I'm, I'm a West Point graduate. I subsequently served. I was a Special Forces officer. Uh, after that, uh, I got an MBA, I got a Master of Science degree in Engineering from SMU, uh, I got my doctorate at Maryland. Um, but from there, my professional skills is what we really kind of emphasize here because we try and breach the bridge between academia and, you know, scholars and professionals. And so in this case, in my case, you know, I was a, a research and development engineer at Texas Instruments on the Star Wars program. Uh, I was a VP of Engineering for a large uh, industrial equipment manufacturer. At the same time, I spent a lot of experience in consulting with manufacturing companies. I was with Price Waterhouse, then Deloitte, then AT Kearney, uh, going, going around the world and we're working with manufacturing companies to get them strategically sound. And then uh, I was a strategy director of a $9 billion retailer. And most recently, I even uh, was the chief investment officer, ran a $6 billion pension fund, which is all those things taken together give you a very, very broad view of 
uh, all the things it takes to be successful in a manufacturing company from you know the r d to the actual manufacturing experience to even how how does finance work into the, the manufacturing realm and how does that make everything move together uh, dr khan uh, is another person on our staff uh, he is uh, works for uh, bell helicopter uh, his, his, he got his operations research uh, doctorate here at SMU. Uh, he's been working there. And I, and I should mention that everybody on our teaching staff uh, is a professional, and they have done what they're teaching for a minimum of two decades. So this is real experience combined with, of course, advanced academic degrees. Once again, we're trying to bridge that gap between scholars and, and, prof and, uh, and practitioners. Uh, Professor Tilly, uh, he has uh, actually been the, uh, the the chief executive officer of an international manufacturing company. He'll bring you a lot of insights into the into the global arena, as well as some of his experiences down on the shop floor. Professor Nowacki, uh, he is, his experience has mostly been in the financial area. He's been the uh, chief financial officer of a, of a few manufacturing companies, as well as going into doing temp jobs to do turnaround work inside manufacturing companies. He can bring that to you. Uh, professor Metters, is uh, one of the chief uh, lean manufacturing people for Halliburton. Uh, he goes around the world helping uh, them lean out their manufacturing processes. He'll teach you about lean manufacturing. Professor Clough is, is a director over at uh, Abbott Labs, and he's really good in the Six Sigma area. So he'll bring you that expertise. Pro Professor Weaver uh, has a lot of work in, uh, in, uh, in leadership and leadership development. And uh, his class is one of those that a lot of people tend to be very, very happy with uh, when they're done with the program. So here's the curriculum that we go through, and I wanted to talk about the things that we bring out in each one of these programs. The first one, ME7301, is uh, entrepreneurship. And there we talk about two kinds of entrepreneurship. One is, of course, the entrepreneurship of how do you go out? We talk about the legal ramifications of starting a company. We talk about how do you go out and get capital and financing and all those kinds of things. But at the same time, and more importantly, for those of you who work inside manufacturing companies now, how do you create and start that entrepreneurship spirit within your company? And we see that in companies like Google and 3M, and we look to them for examples of how do you do that and how do you nurture that? And how do you bring that to bear within your company uh, and, and, make, and make you kind of an, an entrepreneurial spirit within your company and, and have, all of a sudden they're known as that, having that leadership ability. Of course, organizational leadership, we talk about all those uh, things that make leaders uh, very successful within organizations. Uh, computer integrated manufacturing, now we're starting to get into the technical side and you'll notice about half of these courses are technical and the other half are management uh, type uh, programs. The computer integrated manufacturing is more technical. We look at all the things that pull together the different parts of the manufacturing process from, from uh, computer aided design through computer aided uh, manufacturing, through you know, integrated supply chains and, all the, and how all that works together as a system from a computerized standpoint. Manufacturing methods, we're talking a little bit more about how do things operate on the shop floor? <clears throat> um, how, do, how, do you pull the, how do you improve things in the manufacturing uh, facility a lot of times? Things like just-in-time operations, uh, you know, a total quality management and all those kind of methods and systems that have uh, grown and gotten popular in recent years. We'll walk through each one of those things. Manufacturing management, of course, we just talked about the general management skills that you need as a leader. Uh, within the organization and how do you go out and lead a manufacturing organization and all that uh, means. Lean manufacturing is Six Sigma. Six Sigma. Uh, lean manufacturing is, of course, just making sure that your shop floor is really producing and being very efficient. Six Sigma is the way to measure uh, how you're doing all those kinds of things. And now, strategy for manufacturing starts to get a little bit different. Here, we're starting to look at how do you think like an executive? And one of the things that a lot of the people who come out of our program tell us is, you know, I had my own world within, you know, my engineering area, within my manufacturing area, and all of a sudden you opened up this whole new world of how executives are thinking. You know, when the chief executive officer of the company says something, how does that impact me in an engineering area? Or how does that impact me in the manufacturing shop floor? And the things that the chief executive says will impact you, especially if they're driven down efficiently through the process. And so you, as a manufacturing or engineering leader, should be able to look for those cues being able to start to design uh, those things in your department to be able to best support the strategies of the company so that you're more aligned with the overall goals and objectives of the company. And so in the strategies for manufacturing course, that's exactly what we do. We look for those interrelationships. We look for those kinds of things that you should see from 
uh, you know, a chief executive or the chief strategy officer or your VP. And so when you become a vice president of manufacturing or vice president of engineering, you're better skilled to be able to go in and move to that position because you understand the bigger picture. Uh, ME7366, global manufacturing. Now we're starting to look at, you know, all those things around the world that impact the manufacturing process. That includes things like supply chain, of course. You know, how do you make sure that you account for, you know, getting things to and from different countries and integrating those things together and the, a lot of times the taxes and the tariffs involved in those things. But at the same time, global manufacturing, you're dealing with a lot of different cultural issues. So we look at the different cultures of the different uh, countries around the world and how uh, those can impact your manufacturing processes and how you must integrate those. You know, where should you stick your R&D capabilities? Should you stick it closer to the customer in Europe, if that's your target uh, manufacturing area? Or should you have it back here centralized in the United States to be able to look at, uh, you know, pulling everybody together, maybe having more of a, of a sameness product going around the world. Um, in the innovation management program, we look at uh, a lot of different ways in which, uh, um, you know, innovation can impact your the, the manufacturing company. Now, this is a course that uh, we've developed surrounding a lot of the works out of uh, one of my professors at, at MIT. Uh, Jim Mutterback, he wrote a best-selling book on the subject, and at the same time, one of his uh, graduate students, Alan Afua, put a kind of more of a, uh, a a book around how how do you actually get to achieve some of the results that Jim Mutterback puts in his best-selling book. So you have the examples and the stories, but at the same time, you'll have a lot of innovation models that you can actually apply down to the a very uh, lower level within the organization, more granular level within the organization so that you're able to take that and actually take a large idea and do and make very practical steps to, to be innovative within your company. And of course, uh, ME7382, finance and the manufacturing enterprise, you know, you got to be able to read a balance sheet to be able to be a decent executive. And so we're not, we're, you're going to have to learn uh, how to do accounting, how to do finance, and how to drive that all the way through so that you can understand uh, the financial impacts and all the decisions that you as a manufacturing or engineering executive make within your company. So that's our curriculum. <clears throat> Those are some of the things that we, that we talk about through the program. Uh, one of the thing that seems to be very popular is a deferred tuition billing. Now I should mention that this is only uh, for uh, domestic students in, in the, our hybrid program. International students don't have deferred billing in this particular program. But, uh, you know, the standard tuition policy of most schools, especially here at SMU, is to pay tuition at the beginning of the semester. Uh, for executive format programs, uh, it'll be due 45 days following the end of the semester. And the reason that we do that is a lot of companies who reimburse for the program, uh, that gives them time to go back, get the funds from their company, and then have to pay it, not have to pay a lot of out-of-pocket. Uh, that just helps their financial situation a little bit. So we've talked about why manufacturing uh, because of all the opportunities that are here in, in Texas, in the United States, around the world, but why manufacturing systems management in particular? Well, you know, we, we talked about being able to look outside of your world into the larger issues of the company. And so sometimes not understanding those larger issues and how they particularly impact you, that can limit your, pro your progress in your career. So your ability to truly understand the business issues of the company and being able to know what to do at a granular level can really help you progress to the next level within your career. Uh, so you understand out there, you know, all of a sudden, you know, disruptive innovation, some competitors attacking you, you're, uh, all of a sudden your product isn't, isn't selling. Why is that? Maybe there's changing economic conditions. Maybe some competitor has come and started to, to jump into you on the side and, uh, you know, starts to, to make your market share go down. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that, uh, you know, things may not work out as you planned. You have to be able to understand those, plan for those and recognize when they happen and be able to react to them with a good contingency plan. And we'll talk about those throughout the program. So, and that's, you know, linking manufacturing strategy to corporate strategy and to the actual business strategic planning process that we have. How do you link all those things together so that you as a manufacturing leader can best support the overall goals and objectives of the corporation? Understanding financial reports and, and those critical metrics around those financial reports so you know, you know how you're being measured, but more importantly, how you're going to measure those people underneath you. 
And then, uh, of course, understanding the global manufacturing and the supply chain complexity that that brings. A lot of times, just learning the language and the issues that executive management has, you know, when you talk to somebody like, you know, who's actually been the chief executive uh, of a company, he'll be able to tell you, this is what's going on in the mind of the chief executive within the company. And this is how, you know, that person is viewing this. You know, you may view it from this particular angle, but he's got to take all these other things into consideration. So you learn about their issues, you learn about the language, you learn about their concerns, and that helps you be a more effective executive. Uh, understand organizational leadership, how to better lead your team. Um, we talked about computer manufacturing, how do you integrate available technology in, but doing it, anticipating future development, but also doing it in a very cost-effective basis. Of course, learning the latest manufacturing practices, such as lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, total quality, all those kinds of things that tend to make manufacturing companies a lot more competitive, all, all not only here, but around the world. And then of course, how do you create that entrepreneurial spirit within your company? How do you really take that and let, and let it, you know, first of all, make yourself the entrepreneurial spirit driver, but then having your department and those around you really get out there and try to create a lot more value within your company. Uh, the application process. Did you want to talk to this? All right. So I'll talk a little bit about the application process for our graduate students. So uh, first and foremost, you have to submit the online application and the application fee of $75. Our application can be found on our website um, and it's all done online. There's nothing that you have to submit via paper or through the mail or anything like that. We do require transcripts from all institutions that you've attended, all, that you've received college credit. A lot of times I get questions about transcripts. Someone will say, well, I have a transcript from TCU and it has my Tarrant County College grades on it as well. Can you just accept the TCU transcripts? And the answer is that we need transcripts from each individual institution that you've ever attended. So you would need both your TCU and your TCC transcripts whenever you're applying. We do accept unofficial transcripts if you have access to unofficials um, for the application process. If you are admitted to your program, we will then require official documents from you. Um, we do have the option of two letters of recommendation if you would like to submit those. They are not required for the Manufacturing Systems Management Program, but if you have those already written for you or you want someone to write those for you, we will accept up to two of those, but again, they are optional. If you are an international student and you will be studying at SMU on a student visa, you will be required to submit either your TOEFL or your IELTS scores, um, and that's only for international students. For all students, we will require a professional resume, so make sure that you have that prepared in a statement of purpose. In your statement of purpose, you should explain why you want to get this degree, what your educational goals are, what your professional goals are, and how getting this degree will help you achieve those goals. Let the program reviewer know why you want to be in their program, what interests you about the program. Let them know who you are and what your goals are. And if you have any questions over here, I have um, the contact information for Dr. Webb, the contact information for me, Sabrina Gonzalez. If you're a domestic applicant, I work with all domestic applicant inquiries. And Caitlin Long, she works with all of our international students. So if you have any questions about international policies or anything like that, you would reach out to Caitlin. Okay, I believe that that is all that we have as far as the presentation goes. We'll go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion. So please let us know if you have any questions. This would be the time to go ahead and submit those applications or submit those questions and we will answer those as we go. All right. Okay, one of the questions that we have is, do you accept transfer credits to the master's program? I can answer that. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I get, I, I get those all the time. Um, we will accept usually two, uh, a total of six hours from another master's program if they are somewhat parallel to the manufacturing systems management degree program. In other words, you know, if you've got a, a master's degree in Shakespearean literature, we're probably not going to take any of those uh, courses. But if you've got some statistics courses or 
you know, something along the lines of some of the classes that I've just outlined in our curriculum discussion, yes, we'll accept transfer credits for up to six hours for that, so. Wonderful. Another question that we have as far as the application goes was, does the application for manufacturing systems management require a GRE? And MSM does not require a GRE, so you do not have to take the GRE for the MSM program. Some of our other programs within the Lyle School of Engineering do require GRE, so if you're interested in multiple programs, you'll need to check on the website for the department that you're interested in and see if a GRE score is required for that program. Okay, another question that we have is, why would I choose your program over an MBA program um, with a technical focus, something like supply chain management or oil and gas business or anything like that? I'll turn that over to Jim Webb. Um, I guess I'm uniquely qualified to answer this because I have an MBA with, with a technical focus. Um, and the reason for that, it, and it, I, it really depends on what you want to do with your career and how much time you have. Uh, you know, our program is, uh, if, you, if you counted the number of courses in the curriculum, there's 10 courses. And uh, you can get those done over, over a couple of years. Some people get them done more quickly than that. Uh, an MBA program is typically uh, 16 courses. It takes a lot longer time, and it's not going to have uh, a lot of the, the things that we talked about in terms of uh, we, we've uniquely designed some program, uh, some curriculum into ours, like the innovation course, like the manufacturing strategy course that you're typically not going to get in an MBA program, which is that bridge between, uh, you know, the executive and, um, and the actual practitioner who's down in the engineering area and the manufacturing area. So if you're looking to, um, you know, jump right into the corporate staff rather than, you know, continuing to work in the engineering field or the manu down in the manufacturing field, perhaps an MBA is the right thing for you. Uh, you can, if you want to talk to me about that, go ahead and email me and we can go back and forth. I can kind of give you a little bit more details about the pluses and minuses of both. But uh, we've really focused ours so that uh, you can get it in less time and by the way, it's a master of science degree, which if you're working for an engineering company or a technical company, they tend to like master of science degrees, uh, just saying. So um, that may be a, a, another plus that you may want to think about. But go ahead and email me if that's a, a real concern of yours and we can talk about that. Okay, do we have any other questions from the viewers so far? Okay, what about, are there any assistantships or scholarships available for this program? Um, at, at the current time, no, uh, the only, the assistant, there's no, there's nothing within the, uh, in, within SMU that uh, had, we don't have any scholarships for this program, uh, mostly because uh, most all of our uh, p uh, students are working professionals or they're international students that, that come in. Um, so no, there's no scholarships available at this time, um, and I don't. There's no assistance ships that, that are available for the program at this time. Um, but that's mostly because of the nature of the students that we've had so far today. So. Um, a question that I get sometimes is, as a working professional, what is the workload like for students in this program? Well, as I mentioned, um, there's a couple, the, the executive hybrid program is designed to make sure that you can, in fact, be successful in the program. Um, you know, we, we talked about, we have the Monday night lecture. Now that's four hours of, of lecture, but you can, uh, some students actually prefer to, to come to SMU and sit in the class and listen to the lecture. Other students would prefer, prefer to sit down and uh, just listen to the lecture, you know, you download it and watch it on your computer at home. Uh, at your leisure sometime during the week before you come into class on Saturday. You're, you know, you're going to you're going to have class attendance on Saturday. So that's part of your workload. And you're going to have to prepare for classes on Saturday by listening to the lecture and doing other outside, uh, you know, homework assignments that we may have, like, you know, readings, uh, pre case study preparation, you know, maybe doing problem sets uh, and those kinds of things. So that's essentially what the workload is, is, uh, you know, having the two classes per week. Now, I should say, even though we, we offer up to three classes per semester, we, we have them set up such that you're not having two professors competing against each other for your time. We only offer them one at a time, like one at the beginning of the semester, 
and one at the end of the semester. So they're kind of compressed in that way. And so um, I know when I was an undergrad, it seemed like every professor that I had felt his uh, subject was the most important. And by golly, he was just going to give me everything that uh, he could give me. Uh, here, you don't have that problem with, you know, people competing for your time. You only be really, uh, unless you choose otherwise, to really take one class at a time. All right. So another question that we've gotten is, what is the most important thing that you look for in a successful applicant for your program? Um, not, well, there's not really one most successful thing. We're really looking for a variety of things. One is uh, an undergraduate degree in a technical field, um, typically an engineering discipline. That's, you know, something that will certainly, in, in a good GPA, um, that will certainly go a long way. Um, so you're going to have a GPA above 3.0 is something that we're certainly looking for in a technical field. At the same time, and then a, a couple of years of experience, what we're finding is uh, a student who has actually been out and working in a manufacturing field or in an engineering field is going to get a lot more out of the program and understand a lot more about the concepts because they've been out and they've been working in the field for two or three years and they have a lot more tangible feel for exactly uh, the kinds of uh, issues and questions that we're, we're discussing in class. Uh, on the other end, if you if you, all you have is a business degree, if you've got a business degree uh, or a supply chain degree, and you've got a decent GPA, and you've got you know several years of manufacturing experience, you're probably going to do well in the program as well. And so we always take that into account uh, when we're looking at, for admissions. But uh, those those things, manufacturing or engineering uh, experience, and then uh, you know having a good uh, good solid academic baseline before you come into the program are things that we really look for. Okay, let's see if we've gotten any other questions. It looks like that's about it, you guys. So if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to any of us, either Dr. Webb, myself, or Caitlin Long, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, as I mentioned that this was being recorded, so if you have, we will send this out to all students who registered for the webinar as, as well as those who attended. So you guys can have a copy of this and if you um, don't get it, just reach out to us and we'd be happy to send you a copy. Thank you all for attending and we look forward to hearing from you soon.